Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. We're so happy to have you all here. We are, we just opened our weight room uh, up and we are having all of you come on into the Zoom webinar. We're just going to wait, oh, probably 30 more seconds, get everybody in, and then we will begin our program. We're so happy to be with you tonight. Welcome everyone who's coming in from the weight room into our Zoom webinar tonight. So glad to have you, so very glad. And I am going to turn us over to the Executive Director of Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens, Kate Markert. Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Kate Markert. I'm executive director at Hillwood Estate Museum and Gardens. And thank you so much for inviting us into your homes tonight. You can make yourself comfortable. Your cameras and your microphones are not active, but we do want to hear from you. Please say hello in the chat. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with Hillwood members and to meet many of you who are joining us for the first time. You may know that Hillwood has been closed since last year, and I'm so pleased that we can reopen exclusively for members next Tuesday, February 16th. Of course, all of the COVID safety protocols are still in place. We require advanced reservations with timed entry to ensure the safe capacity. And of course, masks are required at all times. We invite the general public to start visiting on Tuesday, March the 2nd. So if you're not yet a member, I invite you to join tonight and take advantage by visiting us very soon. In the virtual world, we have great lectures each Thursday this month. We have weekly docent-led virtual mansion tours. We have floral design programs and some new and very exciting virtual Girl Scout programs. I hope that you'll join us at these upcoming programs and do help us spread the word. Tonight, Stephen F. Burns will virtually whisk us away to explore the extraordinary story of the glory ruin and rebirth of Untermeyer Gardens, a 43 acre estate in Yonkers. You can submit questions using the Q&A module as they cross your mind. Our moderator will make sure we get to them at the end. Stephen is the founder and president of Untermeyer Garden Conservancy. A graduate of Princeton and Columbia Universities, Stephen was a founding partner of BKSK Architects in New York City. Mayor Bloomberg appointed him as a commissioner on the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission, and he has served on the board of Wave Hill Public Gardens and Cultural Center. Recognition of the Conservancy's efforts has been swift and widespread with significant media coverage. Burns has received a number of national awards, including the Garden Club of America, Institute for Classical Architecture and Art, Foundation for Landscape Studies, and the Victorian Society of America. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Burns. Stephen? Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Steve Burns. I'm the uh, president and founder of the Untermeyer Gardens Conservancy, which uh, I started 10 years ago. Okay, there we go. Uh, the Conservancy works in a public-private partnership with the city of Yonkers, which owns the property. The, uh, Yonkers is just north of New York City on the Hudson River. Uh, the garden, uh, a private garden was called the most spectacular garden in America. This is uh, in the 1920s. This is an article from a Baltimore newspaper. Uh, there was a very large uh, mansion that was built during the 1860s by John Waring. Uh, this is a picture of it. Um, he was the largest manufacturer of hats in the world. 
Uh, he went bankrupt about 10 years later and it was sold to Samuel Tilden. Tilden was the governor of New York. Uh, he ran for president of the United States and won the election, uh, the, uh, the, the election by the, the vote count, but lost the, 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 the election through the electoral college. Uh, he then retired from public life and lived up here until his death. In 1899, uh, the estate was purchased by Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer. Samuel Untermeyer was born in 1858 in Virginia, Lynchburg, Virginia. Uh, his family was Jewish. Uh, his father died right after the Civil War, and his mother, the widow, uh, had a little bit of money, and she moved with her children up to New York City. And she uh, uh, bought a tenement on the Lower East Side and ran a kosher boarding house. Um, Samuel was one of her kids, and he was, you know, smarter than anyone, brighter than anyone, just as force of nature as a little boy. He graduated from high school when he was like 15 or 16, from uh, college when he was 18, and from law school when he was 20. In fact, he was too young to practice law at age 20, so he grew a beard to make himself look older. Uh, he became one of the most successful lawyers in America, the first lawyer to make a, a million dollars in a single fee, which back in you know 1906 was a lot of money a brilliant investor and became fabulously wealthy. Um, in 1912, uh, he decided he wanted to work on behalf of the public. He had made so much money that he uh, became uh, the lead prosecutor for something called the Pujo investigation, that's P-U-J-O, which looked into the establishment of of uh, monopolies and, and of robber barons who were kind of man manipulating the economy to their benefit. Uh, during the hearing, uh, he interrogated uh, John D. Rockefeller, whom you see on the left, as well as J.P. Morgan, whom you see on the right. Now, he had actually had sort of a pre-existing relationship with Morgan uh, over 10 years before. Uh, Morgan, like a lot of uh, Christian people, was pretty anti-Semitic, and he did not like this Samuel Untermeyer. One of the things that Morgan liked to do was to breed uh, collies, and he always got the, the pet he always got the blue ribbon. And so Untermeyer decided he was gonna uh, breed collies to compete with Morgan. And there were the, there's huge national competition. The press covered the, the Morgan kennel versus the Untermeyer kennel. And uh, Untermeyer started winning the blue ribbons and there was a bubble in the pet collie market. And it, collies cost an unbelievable amount of money. So anyway, back to the hearing, the Pujo investigation, he really sort of railed into um, Morgan and Morgan was an older man and he said some things he probably shouldn't have said and it really looked to be kind of like a, a, an ogre or yeah, a robber baron. And the press really criticized him harshly and he was pretty upset by it. And he and his wife decided to go to Rome to get out of America, to get away from it. And he, he went there and he died there a couple of months later. And in fact, the Morgan family held Samuel Untermeyer responsible for the death of J.P. Morgan. And no sooner did J.P. Morgan die than Untermeyer got rid of his colleagues because he really didn't have any interest in that whatsoever. Uh, as a result of the, um, uh, the Pujo investigation, there was significant economic reform that took place, such as the establishment of the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, another interesting case was um, that of Herman Bernstein, who's on the right. He was a prominent journalist in America, uh, Jewish, and the man on the left is Henry Ford, who also was a notorious anti-Semite. And he ran a newspaper and was really uh, criticized Bernstein as being in sort of in league with the protocols of the elders of Zion, which was a, a, a horrible anti-Semitic uh, canard, which held that the Jews were gonna take over the world through their control of the banking and, and media uh, industries. Uh, uh, Bernstein hired Untermeyer and his partner to defend him, and uh, he prevailed. Uh, there was not a verdict rendered, but uh, Ford capitulated and he shut down his newspaper and basically, you know, had, had to apologize. Uh, so in uh, the 1890s, uh, Samuel Untermeyer 
uh, met and fell in love with Minnie Untermeyer. This is a picture of her as an older woman. She was not Jewish, she was Lutheran. And so this was totally taboo uh, back then. And in fact, they had two children out of wedlock, uh, but they really loved each other. Uh, and they got married and they had uh, two more children. So as a result, they were incredibly open-minded, progressive, independent-minded people. And you will see time and time again, they were on the right side of history and really quite remarkable. Um, one example of this was the women's suffrage movement, which uh, was codified on a federal level uh, last year, this, uh, the centennial of it. Um, the effort in New York was the most important in all the states. It was a huge, huge monumental effort uh, that was incredibly expensive. And there were 10 men in uh, New York uh, who helped finance uh, this movement. Uh, one of the 10 uh, was Samuel Untermeyer. He was, he was a suffragent. And actually, Minnie wasn't sure that she wanted the right to vote, but Samuel said, yes, honey, you do. And she became also a prominent suffragette. Uh, an interesting story is this is a picture of uh, Gustav Mahler. Um, Minnie was uh, an important person in cultural circle, circles in New York. And she and a few other people brought in Mahler to be the, come the conductor of the New York Philharmonic. And he helped turn it around. Uh, Untermeyer helped finance, you know, really helped support the Philharmonic. And he was only there for a few years, unfortunately became very sick and, had, and went back to Europe to die basically. And Minnie was the one who took him to the ship that would return him home. And he wrote a letter to her saying that of all the people he'd met in New, in New York, that he would miss her more than anyone. Um, so in 1916, uh, Samuel Untermeyer bought some more land adjacent to the mansion in Yonkers. Um, and, he just, and, and there was a mansion there and he tore it down and he decided he wanted to build a garden. Um, so what does he do? He hires the architect William Wells Bosworth, who was the architect for Kiket uh, for the Rockefeller family. So the Rockefellers were the richest people in the world. And um, so he hired their architect, their architect to outdo the Rockefellers. And in fact, there's a letter in the Rockefeller family ar archives written by Bosworth to John D. Rockefeller Jr. many years later saying that Samuel Untermeyer walked into my office and asked me to design the finest garden in the world. So Untermeyer was incredibly ambitious for what this garden would be. He had uh, up to 150 acres. Uh, there were 60 full-time gardeners and 60 greenhouses. Uh, this is a, a, a map uh, showing much of the site. You can see the mansion was actually not in the center of the property. It was off to the left. The river is in the background on the top of the page. Um, and the most famous uh, part of the garden uh, uh, is the walled garden, which is a, a Persian garden. Off of that, you can see a long, skinny uh, flight of stairs that goes down the hill called the Vista. Uh, to the right of the Vista were six um, terraced gardens that were the color gardens. At the bottom of the Vista, uh, to the right of that were a series of gardens that went north called the Rose and Dahlia Gardens, which connected with another chain of gardens called uh, the vegetable or Italian gardens. Uh, below that was a gatehouse um, and there was a mile long carriage trail that swept up through uh, the woods uh, toward the mansion passing uh, a rock garden, a sundial garden and the temple of love and other, uh, uh, other rock gardens. So I'll take you through those gardens. Uh, today, this is what it looks like. Uh, the mansion uh, is gone. Uh, it was uh, torn down uh, and there's a children's home or a, 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 it was a hospital building uh, very nearby. If you look right in front of where the mansion was, you'll see a little circle. Remember that for later. On the right hand side was another hospital, big hospital that was built. And then below that was a nursing home. Uh, so those Italian vegetable gardens are gone and much of the Rosendalia gardens are gone as well. But much of the rest of the property kind of is there. All the land across the street um, on North Broadway where it says landscape plan was also part of the estate. Uh, those were um, agricultural lands and those are all developed now with garden apartments. 
Um, so that walled garden, the walled garden is a Persian garden and that is the oldest garden known to man. They go back over 2,500 years ago to what is now Iran. Uh, Cyrus the Great was the first great Persian emperor around 550 BC. And he built uh, this garden, which is the oldest one for which we have archeological evidence. Uh, it was rectangular, uh, had water circulating around it. Um, and there were various um, uh, pavilions or palaces in which to view the garden. And it was surrounded by a wall. And it was based on the idea of paradise. And, and the word paradise actually comes from the ancient Persian language, paradisa, which means surrounded by a wall. Um, and the gardens probably were originally Zoroastrian, which was the uh, religion of the empire. Um, and they were based on uh, this water flowing through the gardens, which uh, was made possible through the Kanat system. And this is a cross section through a hillside, which would have been adjacent to a mountain. So there were snow capped mountains, the snow melted, the water seeped into the ground, into the water table. And so the ancient peoples uh, tunneled through the ground to capture the water in the water table and uh, would, would siphon that water through canals uh, into their, the gardens, the irrigated land and into the villages. So the Persian gardens and really civilization in Iran would not have been possible without these canals. Um, this is a picture of a uh, Persian garden that was built uh, in the 18th century. You can see the snow-capped mountains in the distance. Uh, you can see the walls around there and you can see the water that goes through. The wall would have gone, the water would have gone through the garden first and then been delivered to the village below. So, oh, let's see about, oh, a thousand or so years later, 800 years later, no, 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 about 1300, 1300 years later, um, Muhammad is born in, uh, in what is now Saudi Arabia. And uh, that uh, Islam, Islam is born. And uh, this new religion takes over these lands, including in Iran. So um, what was Zoroastrian before now is mainly Islamic. And this is a garden that was built in Shiz. Um, this is a reconstruction of it. Uh, uh, ignore the circle in the foreground. That's not a typical uh, characteristic, but these crisscrossing canals behind it are, and you see the crenellated walls are very characteristic, and and the 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 big arched uh, main sort of tower entrance uh, also is is an ancient uh, you know very very old example of a Persian garden. Uh, so this is the facade of our. Uh, of our garden in Yonkers, which is built a little over 100 years ago. You can see the crenellated walls. Um, you can see the central tower. Um, and uh, what was interesting also were the corner turrets that were a feature of some Persian gardens in Iran, but especially later the gardens in India. And at the main gate is a beautiful relief in stone of Artemis. Um, what is incredible is that, um, well, first of all, that the, the Artemis, of course, is the goddess of the Greek goddess of the hunt. She's associated with nature and fertility. But before she was a Greek goddess, she was a Persian goddess. And in fact, Cyrus the Younger, um, the great grandson of Cyrus the Great, also built a Persian garden. And while the garden is long since gone, there's an ancient description of it that remains by, uh, by the Xenophon in which he said this garden had a relief of Artemis over the front door. So it is incredible that Bosworth knew this. It shows how scholarly and how brilliant he was. Um, as you go through that first gate, again, these are like the gates of paradise. The photograph on the left, you can see the horizontal block of stone over the, the entrance, as well as the triangle of stone. That is a, an allusion to the, uh, my, the, the lion's gate in Mycenae on the right, um, which is about 1200 BC in what is now Greece. So this is um, Mycenaean architecture. So what's fascinating about this design of the garden is that it is a kind of a layering of, of a Persian you know, ancient garden with a Greco-Roman overlay of classicism, which we'll see more of later. Um, as you walk through the garden, then you see 
uh, the canals here. So again, the crisscrossing canals uh, which meet at the center symbolize the four rivers of paradise, uh, which is described in the book of Genesis. So these guard that what was paradise under um, uh, Zoroastrianism uh, becomes the Garden of Eden in uh, the Abrahamic religions. So Judaism described the book of the the, the uh, Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis, saying that there were four rivers: the Tigris, Euphrates, the Gihon, and the Pishon rivers, uh, and that was surrounded by a wall, the Garden of Eden. And there were also two trees in the Garden of Eden: the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. And you'll see we have these two incredible trees when you come in. So this. Uh, belief of the Garden of Eden is actually also a Christian and an Islamic belief. So it is really sort of a universal belief. And, and it's just this wonderful coming together of the different cultures and religions uh, going back to ancient Persia. Uh, this is a period photograph uh, in Antramar's day. Again, when it was built, this had been previously, there was a mansion there. And there were various trees in the garden. And uh, Bosworth wanted Untermeyer to cut the trees down, but he refused. And so it's hard to see, but the, the pathways that go down actually, you had to walk around the trees initially. Eventually the trees died and they're no longer in the middle of the paths. Uh, these are the two beautiful trees that you come in under. So these are weeping um, uh, European beech trees, again, sort of alluding to two great garden, two great trees in the Garden of Eden. And in the foreground is the intersection of the four rivers, each with a bridge over it. Uh, uh, the gardens uh, in Iran, in the Middle East, spread with Islam. So, they, uh, so Islam spread across the north of Africa into Spain. And one of the greatest uh, Persian gardens in the world is the Alhambra. Uh, this is a picture of it here. This doesn't have four rivers. It just has one long basin, but you see the crenellated tower in the background and you see in the foreground, the source of one of what, like a river of paradise. And so at Untermeyer, we also have these marble basin, basins, which Bosworth designed as an allusion to the Alhambra. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that um, Untermeyer was this you know, rare, patron of gardens in America, you know, in the turn of the century, if you were rich, uh, it was very fashionable to have a great garden. But I would say that 99% of the gardens were built for people who were Christian. So I also like to say that Persian garden, this is the finest Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere, because really it's pretty much the only Persian garden in the Western Hemisphere. So why did Bosworth design such an unusual garden type? for such an unusual client. And there's nothing written about it whatsoever, but could it be that Bosworth was thinking about uh, medieval, you know, medieval Spain? Ninth century Spain was that rare period in time uh, when the Alhambra was built, uh, that the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims all got along. And, and uh, that here we had a, a Jewish client whose wife was Christian and they built uh, an Islamic garden. And what was interesting is if you were Jewish in the 19th century, your synagogue architecture might likely have been Moorish style architecture. And in fact, we are quite sure that the Untermeyers were married in what is now Central Synagogue on Lex Lexington Avenue near Citibank, which is this incredible Moorish style uh, synagogue. So um, Islam also spreads east into India. And the Mughal Empire, the, one of the greatest empires of the world, one of the wealthiest empires, the 15th through the 17th, 18th centuries was Islamic. Um, and so really in India and Pakistan is where the Persian garden type reaches its absolute you know, peak uh, because of the incredible wealth uh, and grandeur. Uh, so the, of course the most famous of those gardens is the Taj Mahal. Um, so if you look here on the left is a plan of the Taj Mahal. You can see the entrance tower at the bottom. You can see it's walled on three sides. It's open uh, at the back, which is at the top, crisscrossing water canals. At the corners, there are turrets. And 
each of the four quadrants uh, from the four rivers uh, is subdivided into four. And by the way, this whole thing with the four, the rivers symbolize the rivers of the Garden of Eden. They, they symbolize the, the, the rivers of life under Islam, wa uh, milk, water, honey, and wine. The four quadrants symbolize the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. They also symbolize the four cardinal directions symbolizing the availability of paradise to the whole world. So it's like this universal vision of paradise, the Garden of Eden. On the right is, is Untermeyer. So there again, you see the central entrance tower at the bottom, the four corner turrets, crisscrossing canals. At the back, rather than a tomb, there is a large pool with an amphitheater. And on the left, uh, that is where it's open to the Hudson River. So it's only walled on three sides. Most of these gardens are walled on four sides. And there's a central temple with a pool, a swimming pool below that's a ziggurat shape, again, which is a, a Persian shape. But you'll see the actually a lot of the architecture in the garden is classical. So looking down the, uh, the, the length of the canals, uh, you see the amphitheater here. This year, we, the year that this photograph was taken, uh, we planted elephant ears uh, along the canals. They're annual, so every year they change. Uh, this is a photograph that was taken uh, during the height of the depression. <laughs> and this is his gardening staff. Uh, when he's reduced to like, there are only like 40 gardeners there. He had, before that had 60 gardeners. And on the lower section uh, is a photograph uh, showing uh, one of the greenhouses of the 60 greenhouses when people, it was open to the public, the garden. And this is the incredible thing. So he opened his garden to the public one day a week for 25 years. The only other great garden in America that was open to that extent was Longwood Garden owned by the DuPont family. But Untermeyer's garden was right by New York City. You could take a streetcar there. You could take trains there. It was highly accessible. So incredible numbers of people went there. And you hear all these stories and you can't believe it. But I was doing research in the New York Times and I found this article. And I'm gonna read a little bit of it. This is October 29th. A crowd of 30,000 persons today visited the free flower show in, in Yonkers. The superintendent revealed that many of the visitors came from foreign lands and distant parts of this country, as well as a city to see all the flowers. Additional policemen are necessary to facilitate the movement of traffic at the Albany Post Road and the movement of sightseers in and around the gardens. So this was one of his weekly open days. And the New York Times reported that 30,000 people came. Um, another interesting event that occurred at the garden uh, where they had wonderful parties, the, the Democratic National Convention in 1924 was at Madison Square Garden and Entremeyer was a big Democrat. He invited all of the delegation and their wives to a dinner party. So we're talking about a dinner party for 1800 people. Uh, there was a huge storm and it was just a disaster. <laughs> and this is on the front page. This is the headline, the top left corner article of the New York uh, times, Untermeyer party wrecked by storm. So what I said was talking about the classical architecture, as you may know, the three orders of architecture are the Doric at the top, Ionic in the middle, and the Corinthian at the bottom. So on the right, as you go in the garden, is what we call the East Stoa, which we have filled with beautiful um, tropical plants. Um, and like Persian gardens, there are these pavilions or spaces where you can sit and, and look at the garden. And the columns here are Doric. Um, uh, at the back of the garden, um, uh, Bosworth was influenced by the Boboli Gardens in Florence, uh, in which there are paired columns that you see here in Florence that lead across a bridge to an island where there is a fountain. Uh, the fountain of Oceanus. And what interesting, Bosworth um, did a reproduction of the fountain and placed it in the courtyard of Kaikat at the Rockefeller estate. And he took the paired columns in front uh, and reproduced, you know, reinterpreted that at Untermeyer Gardens. So this is a picture here from the amphitheater looking back at the gardens. These columns uh, uh, are. Ionic, again, the, the, the second order of architecture, looking in the distance towards the circular temple. Um, on top of the columns 
are sphinxes carved by Paul Manship, one of the greatest sculptors of America. In addition, he uh, did two bronze sculptures, Manship did a bronze uh, of Diana and Acteon, which flanked the amphitheater. So there were four Manship sculptures in the garden. Manship sculpted the Prometheus Unbound at Rockefeller Center ice skating rink, which you probably know of. Um, Bosworth was also um, uh, looking at the, the Mughal Gardens of India. In fact, he had in his library the only book that showed um, Persian gardens, and he looked at it. it as the only garden that had recently been published in Eng English. This is a, um, uh, a watercolor of Shalimar in um, Kashmir, showing the emperor seated on his throne with sort of a slot of water uh, coming into a pool. And at Untermeyer, uh, between the columns is a slot of water going into that pool. Uh, and in that pool, we have beautiful aquatics. Um, uh, and uh, 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 the, as, I, as I mentioned, the amphitheater, uh, which you can see in the background there, uh, in front of the columns uh, is the stage of the amphitheater, which are beautiful mosaics that you see on the left. And they're based on uh, other Mycenaean design on the right. Uh, which is interesting. So that's also like 1200 BC. So we have this Mycenaean influenced mosaic opposite that Mycenaean gate at the, uh, at the entrance. Um, this is a photograph during Untermeyer's life in, in the 30s. Uh, he had an incredible chrysanthemum show in the fall every year. So um, he had these weeping, you know, grown in the 60 greenhouses, uh, uh, chrysanthemums weeping over the walls here, the crenellations of the amphitheater, each of the chrysantha of the crenellations had another planter of chrysanthemums and there are these huge mushroom-like small trees of chrysanthemums. So this was done again for his private garden at his own house, which he opened to the public one day a week. Um, so what we've done is we've planted uh, th that pool with magnificent um, aquatics. We we planted annuals on either side of the paired columns to, you know, imitate the effect that he had of the the, the waterfall of chrysanthemums. The um, if you look the sort of yellow tall um, uh, plants growing. Uh, this is in the late fall. Are uh, papyrus. And, and papyrus, of course, in the ancient world was used to make paper. And so what we want to do is to kind of relate the horticulture to the architecture. And the capitals for the ionic columns have scrolls, which of course were scrolls of paper. Uh, in the pool, we have fish. And just to remind you that in, in a Persian garden, your senses are supposed to be overwhelmed by the beauty of nature. You're supposed to see the fish swim, smell the flowers. You're supposed to hear the birds call and to see all of God's creation. Uh, this is another picture uh, uh, of the year when we planted chrysanthemums along the canals. This is to honor the Indian heritage of the, the garden. As you may know, uh, Indian people love um, uh, chrysanthemums, uh, not chrysanthemums, uh, the marigolds. Uh, they have chains of marigolds uh, at, at at weddings and, and special occasions. And uh, when we did this, uh, there was a huge article in the Wall Street Journal about marigolds and we were flooded with Indian families coming to see it. And we've had a strong Indian um, following since then, which is wonderful. Uh, at the Temple of the Sky, which you'll see in a moment, there are other great mosaics. Uh, the Untermar Gardens uh, were reputed to have the largest outdoor array of mosaics in America. This is a mosaic of Medusa. Notice the shaded stone going from darker to lighter, lighter in the center. Uh, uh, Bosworth selected Medusa because she was the offspring of two marine gods. And he wanted that to relate to the two water features of the walled garden, which are the four rivers of paradise within the garden and the Hudson River without the garden. I was giving a tour one day and there was a woman there who was a, a visitor who was a classics teacher. And she said, had I ever heard of the story of Medusa and uh, the Aegis? And I said, no. And she said, often um, in antiquity, uh, shields, Roman shields for soldiers were embossed with the image of Medusa. And that image was surrounded by kind of like a collar, 
surrounding it. And that symbolized the aegis, which was a symbol of power and strength that would protect you as you went into battle. It was also an important uh, 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 source of power for Zeus. And so what this woman was saying is what's very interesting is this temple is unusual. It doesn't have a roof. It's open. It's an open ring. And so Medusa is on the floor of the temple and she's looking up at the sky where Zeus is and Zeus is looking down at her and the whole aegis, the whole, excuse me, the whole rim, the ring of the temple become, acts as an aegis. So it's like the unification of the heavens and the earth. And it's the, the, sour, the source of power and energy for the garden. So it's a real, the caput mundi. So it's a very, very powerful um, kind of statement for what uh, the source, the center of the garden, looking out towards the river. Um, if you look along the sides of the, of the temple, uh, the lower picture on the left was when we started, before we started uh, work in the garden, there were just a few junipers uh, in the garden, hardly anything planted whatsoever. And after a year, uh, this is what it looked like on the right. Um, uh, the corner turrets uh, were planted before with um, uh, fastigiate or upright um, sweet gums to emphasize the verticality of the towers. And you can see uh, the, the planting becoming richer and bigger over, over the years. On the left, you can see an inset photo of what it looked like in Untermeyer's day. So he had 60 full-time gardeners. So he would do two or three major plantings of a, a year, put something in, rip it out, put it again, rip it out again for the fall. Uh, we don't, we only have six or seven gardeners, so we have things that are more uh, permanent or perennial. Uh, this is again another shot of it, looking back towards the temple, and the inset photograph would have been the fall season in the Untermeyer period when he had uh, the chrysanthemum show. There's another picture. This is another picture along the canals when we had the marigolds. Looking in the distance is a magnificent tree. It's a it is a, an atlas cedar, which looks like it could have been transplanted from Iran or, or, or a cedar of Lebanon, this beautiful horizontally structured uh, tree with sort of bluish uh, needles. As you come down uh, the steps uh, from the temple, you come to the lower level. And what's interesting at those steps, uh, again, Bosworth, highly literate, uh, he was inspired in those steps uh, by the Doge's palace in Venice. Uh, and uh, at that lower level, we've planted a hydrangea collection intermixed with other plants. We have almost 40 types of hydrangeas. Uh, this is a picture of the, what we call the Temple of the Sky during Untermeyer's period. Uh, and what was below that ziggurat was actually a swimming pool uh, with a deep end and a shallow end, a ziggurat shape, which was lined with the most unbelievably beautiful mosaics. This is a picture of what it looks like now. The mosaics are all in ruin, but it, in the lower right, you can sort of see a pattern of like eddying uh, whirlpools of water into which were inserted an incredible number of mosaic sea creatures. So here you just see some of them. Uh, this pool we hope to restore as a reflecting pool. So it will only be two feet deep and all of the mosaics will be recreated exactly as they were and uh, they will be filled, it will be filled with water year round. So there will be no uh, buckling and destruction through uh, freezes and thaw. Uh, this is another picture looking at that lower terrace towards a, a loggia on the north end. Uh, this was a private party that took place in the garden. You can see men and women in formal attire. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, an orchestra on the, the right. You can see the conductor. And in the foreground are the Isadora Duncan dancers dancing uh, in bare feet. So this is the beginning of modern dance in America. Uh, here they are uh, in, in the amphitheater at the Wall Garden. Um, so what's interesting about this is design uh, that Bosworth does is he takes you into the Wall Garden, you kind of walk around there, you see the Temple of the Sky, you go down the steps by the pool, and then you come down to the lower terrace and you really, there's no obvious way to get out um, it's kind of walled off. You can see the river, but there really isn't a way to get out. So he, he, he throws the screen of columns uh, on the right side. And that's where all those people were sitting when they were watching the performance of the Azur 
Isadora Duncan dancers. And so the Untermeyers traveled to Europe every summer. Uh, Untermeyer's family was German Jewish. He would sometimes see his relatives in Germany, uh, but they would look at gardens. And one of the things they really loved was the Villa d'Este uh, at Lake Como, which is now a fabulous hotel. And um, he said to Bosworth, could you design something for me in Yonkers like that? So what Bosworth does is he takes you up through these columns, You're, you encounter a blank wall, and then on the left, you'll see just a little gate that's like four feet wide. And this is what he gave you. So on the left is the Villa d'Este at Lake Como in the background with the mountains lined with uh, Italian uh, cypresses and a stepped wall, which is actually a fountain leading down. So what was built on the right is in the Yonkers. Uh, it was lined with Japanese cryptomeria rather than Lake Como. There's a Hudson River. Rather than the mountains, we have the Palisades. This was called the most monumental garden feature in a private garden in America. And it is the most spectacular garden, uh, spectacular feature in the garden and was Untermeyer's favorite feature probably because he suggested it. Um, this is what it looked like when we started. It was completely overgrown. You know, all the cryptomeria were gone. You could barely see the river. And, uh, and in fact, during the year, um, the weeds were six to eight feet high on the inside of the wall. So you couldn't really even see the wall. So this has been restored. And this is what it looks like now. So we have planted the Japanese cryptomeria. They're doing incredibly well. Uh, we planted, uh, uh, Hekanakloa in, in board of the wall, which is bold, uh, low maintenance and perennial. And we have bold uh, planters uh, on the stairs going down. Uh, and the, the view to the river has been opened up as it was originally. At the bottom of the vista are these columns. And I don't know if I mentioned that the columns at the amphitheater, the paired columns holding the uh, sphinxes are Cipollino. And Cipollino is this beautiful marble that comes from Turkey or Switzerland that has this beautiful gray green veining. And these columns are also Cipollino. Not only that, they are ancient Roman columns, 2000 years old. They are the greatest ancient columns in the Western hemisphere. There's one column at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that's maybe 10 to 12 feet high. These are almost 25 feet tall and they are monolithic, which means they are single shafts of marble. They were um, imported by Stanford White. He was murdered, the art, great architect. He was murdered in 1906. Somehow Bosworth heard about these columns and persuaded Untermeyer to buy them. So at the most monumental garden feature in America, it is terminated by these national treasures and it is truly impressive. Here you can see a detail of, of this, the, the, the gray green veining, which is beautiful. And another shot of it on the left. It's on the circular uh, uh, platform. that kind of hovers over the cliff looking over and with a magnificent view of the river. So as you go down the vista with the cryptomeria, on the right were the color gardens and you really couldn't see them, but there were gaps in that wall where each of the six color gardens were. They all lined up in a row. They had stairs connecting them. They were different shapes. Many of them had fountains. So as you went down the vista, you couldn't see anything, but you could hear water. And there would be like this little gap in, in the, the cryptomeria, like a little archway. And you'd pass through that. And you'd come to this new world. And um, you could look up and down. And the reason they were called color gardens is because each one of them was planted in a single color. So there's a blue garden, a red garden, a pink garden, whatever. Um, some of the color gardens now are owned by the hospital. We're in uh, uh, a dialogue with the hospital to do a land swap where we can get back some of the color gardens. Uh, it's all filled with garbage and litter. You can see some steps on the left. And on the right, I dug down uh, almost through 12 inches of soil and found uh, uh, this is one of the fountain basins. Uh, this is the lowest of the color gardens, which is owned, uh, this is in parkland. So this is owned by the city. Uh, and this is what it looked like before we started work. 
and this is what it looks like now. There's no garden there yet, but we've revealed the stairs, we revealed the fountain, we cut down two trees, and we got a great view of the Hudson River in the distance. Uh, so this again was the lowest of the color gardens. As you look out over the rim of that color garden, you look down to what were the Italian, the, um, the Rose, or, Rose and Dahlia gardens. And this is what it looked like uh, when we started. Uh, the weeds were, you know, eight feet tall. There was so much um, under, there was so much leakage from the canals in the Persian garden that it had got water got in the water table and it was all settling down here. And this had, part of it had reverted to a swamp and there was swamp grass there. So when we, we repaired the, uh, the fountains, uh, the swamp went away. We mowed this thing down uh, and we uh, are now in the process of recreating uh, the, the uh, rose and dahlia gardens, but they're not gonna be rose and dahlia gardens, they're gonna be vegetable gardens ornamental vegetable gardens to recall the ornamental vegetable gardens that were adjacent, um, which are no longer extant. They were destroyed for the nursing home. So um, these are underway. You can see the ancient columns to the left and the Hudson River in the foreground. Um, what was interesting is um, on the right side of these uh, gardens, uh, it stepped down and, and we dug out these stairs as well. You can see those columns on the left. We're gonna build a trellis on top of that uh, in the spring. But there was another garden, you know, again, this part of the Rose and Dahlia garden. Uh, we, we, we mowed, you know, we cut down all the weeds and we, it turned into grass and we could see little bits of steel edging. And I was picking around with my shoe one day, it was March. And, you know, I said, boy, this is interesting. There seems to be a real pattern. There's like this curving circle thing. And, and I, I went up uh, to talk to the gardeners and I said, you know, what should we do about this? Should we spray paint it or put little flags to show, you know, what it looked like? And um, one of the gardeners who was a photographer, it started snowing. So like the next an hour later, there was a little snow that came down and it had been sunny in the morning and she came down and she took a picture. And what happened was the edging, which had been in the sun, melted the snow and it gave you the ghost of part of the pattern. Uh, so this is what we saw. And so last summer, uh, we had summer interns from our local high schools uh, digging out uh, the original edging, which is uh, still there, it's hundred years old. And this is what they unearthed. And this is gonna become an orchard. Uh, so uh, this was just dug up last year and it'll be a wonderful, prod, uh, wonderful uh, in combination with the vegetable garden. So it'll be a vegetable garden and an orchard. The orchard will be superimposed, a grid of trees on top of the original geometry uh, that you see here. Uh, the garden went quite a bit further. You can see there's a hedge beyond it, uh, but that's no longer part of the garden. Uh, then what was interesting, just uh, adjacent to these gardens was another garden called, we call the Long Garden, which Untermeyer added later. Uh, and it was almost a thousand feet long. So this is what it looked like back then. Uh, and we will eventually restore a part of it. This is looking south towards the ancient columns, which are behind the trees. So, so what was beyond uh, the um, the uh, Rose and Dahlia garden were what I had mentioned were the it Italian gardens or vegetable gardens. And they were terrace gardens. The pavilions here are very similar to pavilions at Kaiket. Um, they existed in the 90s when I lived in Yonkers and I went and explored there. It was a total jung jungle. This, this picture was taken like in the 30s is looking north up to the Tappan Zee where the Tappan Zee bridge is. And it was a total jungle. And I brought a shovel with me and I dug down and I found those, if you, you can see in, in the middle, there was a rill, R-I-L-L, -L, and, and there were white marble fountains in the middle. And at each terrace, there was another semicircular uh, uh, fountain that would, went down to the next level. So there were five of these levels. I dug down and what I found was cobalt blue tiles. So all of these rills were lined in cobalt blue tiles. So below uh, this uh, was Woods, and uh, it went down to the Old Croton Aqueduct, uh, which is now New York State Park. 
the garden was never designed to be entered from below. So what we did was we decided, but now it is entered from below. It, it, is a, it is a secondary entrance. So we're trying to figure out how to get people from this really low point up to the historic gardens because it was really steep and there was no designed element. So what we decided to do was to create sort of a slowly ascending path through the woods um, to that orchard, future orchard area. Samuel Untermeyer had the largest collection of rhododendrons in the country. He had something like 20,000 rhododendrons, they're all gone. So we decided to create the rhododendron walk. This is a picture of it. And this was, all, this was created the year before uh, last, is 2019, by a different group of high school kids. So this is the, these are the kids. Uh, and then what it was at the very bottom, sort of facing the old Croton Aqueduct, was this. So this was a, a, a gatehouse at the lower entrance. Um, it was in complete ruin, covered with vines. You barely could see it covered in graffiti. In the foreground were, was a wall that was collapsing and these two sculptures of a lion on the right and a headless horse on the left. The, the head had been vandalized and destroyed in the 60s. And so one of, so we wanted to restore it and we were gonna you know, put a, a horse head back on in marble. And one of my board members is Barbara Israel. She's the leading garden antiques dealer in America. And she was looking through some auction catalogs in England and saw them for a lion and a unicorn. And she said, Steve, I think that that might have been a unicorn. Um, and these are English sculptures because the lion and the unicorn are on the coat of arms of Great Britain and the British royal family. And the lion symbolizes England and the unicorn symbolizes Scotland. And of course the unicorn is a mythical creature that was half goat and half like horse and it had a cloven hoof. I was on the phone with Barbara and I said, okay. So I hung up the phone and I ran down the hill and this is what I saw. It was a cloven hoof. It was not a horse hoof. So that was the proof that this was in fact a unicorn. Uh, in Untermeyer's day, we later, later found out, uh, discovered a photograph of it, but it did not have a horn. So it must have been broken off or something. And no doubt Untermeyer thought he had a horse. So when we restored the head, we gave it a stub of a horn. So if you look closely, you can see a stub. It looks like it's broken off to show that it was a unicorn. And we rebuilt the stone columns. We cleaned the sculptures. The lion now is looking pretty good. And then there's the uh, gatehouse beyond. So what we did, it was covered with graffiti. We removed all the graffiti on the outside, but on the inside, it was all covered with graffiti, some of which was satanic because there was a whole satanic cult and animal sacrifices and horrible things that took place here in the 70s. Um, we restored, you know, we, we you know, made it structurally stable. It, it had been the scene of multiple fires. So anything that was wooden had long ago burned away. So the floors, the walls, the windows, the second floor, you know, the ceilings, the, the roof joist, everything, the roof, everything that was wood was gone. So all that we had left was the masonry shell. And so what we decided to do was to build a ruined garden. And, um, you know, you go to England and there are these ruins, like you'll see pyramids or columns and they're artificial ruins, you know, you're supposed to make you think of, you know, the passage of time and mortality. And, but at Untermeyer, we didn't have to build an artificial ruin. We had a real ruin. And so we filled all the soil, we removed all the soil, put in fresh topsoil, but we kept all the graffiti as a kind of a, a, a statement, as a memory of the vandalism and the incredible desecration that occurred to the garden in, in the, in the, particularly in the 60s, 70s, and in the, into the 80s, um, uh, not to try to whitewash it, but to keep it. So we've created this wonderful little uh, garden in there. And on the left, actually, you can see that was a fireplace on the wall. And on the second floor, that was the fireplace for the second floor. So they were, you know, stacked on top of each other and there's a chimney. 
So back to the um, where the, the lion was, here you can see the lion pre-restoration. This is a carriage trail uh, that led up the hill, mile long to the, to the mansion. It, there were so many fallen trees on it that um, the carriage trail had not been uh, walkable in a generation. So our, our, at the time, one uh, gardener, you know, single-handedly cut down, you know, removed all these trees uh, one winter, and now it's this wonderful path. The path led up to what was toward the mansion, what was called the Temple of Love. And the Temple of Love was unbelievably overgrown. Again, it's just a total jungle. This is what it looked like. This is uh, what it looks like now. In fact, it looked like last week. We've got a lot of snow now. Um, we have um, cleared it out. Uh, we've created uh, from the jungle a beautiful lawn in the front, which is now the Cherry Bowl. It has a beautiful collection of cherry trees and it looks out over the river. You know, the, 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 the vista looks straight across the, the, from the Italian gardens, you have the great view looking north up the river. This gives you a view looking south down the river. So you see the river in different ways. Um, this uh, is the temple. It's built upon this man-made confection of boulders and rock outcropping, some of which is natural, much of which is not. Um, this is a drawing on the right by Fragonard of the Temple of the Sibyl in Tivoli in England, which, was an, which is an ancient temple, an ancient circular ruined temple that was built on a cliff with a waterfall coming out of it. And, you know, I'm sure that's something that Bosworth was thinking of. It was made by Carlos Davite, which, who was a very skilled uh, Genoese rock mason who came to America, who did uh, significant work at the St. Louis World's Fair and the, and the Paris Exposition. Uh, from the temple itself, when you looked down, when you looked down, uh, this is what you saw. This is like you know nine, eight years ago. Again, total jungle. We've restored that, and that has been cleared. Uh, everything has been restored. We rebuilt uh, those uh, the that uh, those what we call the cascades going down to the lower basin. Uh, we rebuilt a uh, a little arbor at the bottom. We've cleared out a meadow below that, uh, which has been planted with tens of thousands of daffodils. It's now called Daffodil Hill. Uh, and when we restored the, the waterfalls, there are five waterfalls now there, but we didn't exactly know much about it other than what we could see and because there are no photographs. So I Googled um, Isadora Duncan and Untermeyer on the New York Times, not the only thing to do, it was just, you know, Googling, I Googled it. And, um, uh, and I saw something that said Irma Duncan. So I don't know, so I click Irma Duncan and then this picture came up. And so Isadora Duncan, as you may know, was, um, was strangled uh, and killed uh, by her scarf, which got caught in the, the axis, axle of her convertible when she was driving in France in the, I think the twenties and she died. But the, her dance company survived, still is in existence today. They per, have performed at Untermeyer Gardens, but all of the dancers took her last name as if she adopted them. So Irma Duncan was one of the dancers. And this is a photograph of Irma Duncan, this beautiful sort of art deco uh, artistic photograph, I think by Arnold Geth, who is a well-known photographer. And this is the only photograph we have showing the functioning waterfall during the Untermeyer period. So we've restored them now and it was a thrill to be able to do that. And now we have five waterfalls. The areas around it, uh, we, we've recovered that. We have a beautiful shade garden that's emerging. Um, this is a picture looking from the bottom of the Cascades, looking all the way up to the temple with out of sight on the left filled with uh, beautiful grasses and asters. Here you can see the asters. So this would be like in September. This has only been in the ground for three years. Uh, the, the boulders, you know, most of them are all, you know, hand laid and many of them, or almost all of them are hollowed out. And uh, these were all little planters planting, we call planting pockets. There's something like 313 planting pockets 
So Untermeyer probably had, you know, one or two gardeners whose full-time job was just maintaining all these planting pockets. So we're planting a lot of those back as well. So right next to the Temple of Love was another garden called the uh, Rock Garden, which Untermeyer built in the 30s. So he kept adding to the garden. He loved the fact that 30,000 people came to the garden. In fact, he would follow people and he would eavesdrop on their conversation and he would listen to their comments and if they misidentified a plant, he would correct them and give the correct Latin name. So it was really kind of funny that way. But he, uh, so he added various gardens. This is, uh, I, I, just, I found these photographs in Washington where you live uh, at the Smithsonian Archives of Great American Gardens. And, you know, it said Untermeyer, you know, it said Greystone, which is the Untermeyer State in Yonkers. I had no idea where this was. I mean, there was no evidence whatsoever where this could have been um, um, because this is where the rock garden was. This was the rock garden. This is what it looked like when we started work. And Timothy who was our head gardener. He knew that there was a rock garden somewhere. And in the winter, another winter, when he wasn't work clearing out the carriage trail, he's poking around and he saw, he discerned a pattern of rocks under all the brush. And he called me and said, Steve, I think that I may have found the rock garden. So lo and behold, um, uh, he started uh, uh, digging things out. This is a photograph again from the Smithsonian showing a little seating area. It has this weird column with like a gnome or some sort of strange sculpture on top. So Timothy was digging around and lo and behold, he found fragments of the bench and that little triangular thing in, in the foreground was where that column was. So this is another picture from you know, the 1930s shows the little waterfalls going down. Timothy dug it out and that's what he found. So we had this for a couple of years and then we, thankfully we got a grant and we rebuilt uh, the rock garden. We doubled it in length so it would connect to the bottom of the uh, Temple of Love and take advantage of the pumps and the pump house and the electrical and plumbing that was already there. And so that was rebuilt the, you know, the, the hardscape, uh, which was done two years ago. So this would have been 2019. And last year, 2020, we planted like 3000 plants. Um, and this is like the day after it was planted. So it's already looking amazing. And it's a whole new garden that was just built out of the wilderness just last year. You can see the temple of love in the distance. So off to the right in the woods was another garden that Untermeyer added also in the 30s, which he built in his typical not modest way <laughs> as the world's largest living horticultural sundial. And this is a photograph of him setting his watch by the sundial. So this is totally now in the woods and overgrown uh, and um, uh, it is uh, uh, something we've not yet restored. So Untermeyer became friends with Albert Einstein in 1921 when Einstein came to America to raise money for uh, Israel. Uh, and um, they really kind of hit it off. And, and, and uh, Einstein asked Untermeyer if he could wire some money to him because he was worried about what was happening in Germany. 1921. So he did. And so all during the 20s, they, um, he was investing this little pot of money for Einstein and they would visit when they traveled to Europe. So then fast forward. Um, and so what was interesting is that part of the money that was raised um, uh, by Einstein and uh, through Untermeyer was to go also to what is now Hebrew University in, um, in uh, Jerusalem. And um, uh, when Minnie died in 1924, a few years later, Untermeyer um, gave a lot of money to Hebrew University to build this amphitheater, which was called the Minnie Untermeyer Amphitheater, probably the only feature there that was named for a Christian woman. So fast forward to 1933. So uh, Adolf Hitler comes to power in Germany and uh, you know, most of Europe and America is in denial. They do not wanna confront what's happening. They've come out of World War I. 
don't want to get in another war in the, you know, or in the middle of the depression. And no one could believe that, Ger that, that Hitler would really you know, cause that much trouble. Uh, but sure, some people did. And they wanted to start a major international movement to combat Nazism. And uh, Samuel Untermeyer in his 70s, he's now like 73, four years old. Most people were dead by their, that age back then. Uh, he was still working. He became the head of this movement. It was called the Non-Sectarian Anti-Nazi League. He, he traveled all over America to preach uh, against the evils of Nazi. The Nazis were very worried about what Untermeyer was doing. They uh, monitored his movements. Uh, he had to have a bodyguard. The British press called Samuel Untermeyer Hitler's bitterest foe. In 1934, the next year, there was a huge convention at Madison Square Garden of the American Nazi Party. These were Americans who liked what was happening in Germany. And at the end of the convention, someone named mentioned the name of Samuel Untermeyer, and there were 15,000 people in the room, and they chanted, hang him, hang him, hang him. And you can read about this in an article in the New York Times. So Untermeyer, you know, uh, tried to go to his uh, friends to mobilize them against uh, uh, the Nazis and struck out time and time again. The head of Macy's, uh, uh, Percy Strauss, continued to sell. The idea was that we would try to defeat Nazism through an economic boycott, that no one would buy or sell anything that was manufactured in Germany and to expose Nazi propaganda. And so he went to like Macy's to try to persuade them not to sell German goods. And they said, no, you know, we're not going to mix politics and economics. He tried to place a full page ad in the New York Times talking about the importance of the boycott and how certain department store owners continue to sell German goods. Didn't say Macy's, didn't say Strauss. And the Times would not take his money to place the ad in the New York Times because they're most valuable uh, they're the most important advertisers were the department stores. Then he went to um, Einstein and Einstein had just gotten the job at Princeton. And he said, you are a poster child for a German Jewish refugee. You can tell the world what is happening in Germany and you can help us in the boycott. And Einstein also said, no, he wanted to help humanity with his science. And he got involved in certain refugee issues. And it wasn't really until 1940 that, Untermar that uh, Einstein stepped up to the plate. So there was a rift that developed between these two old friends. And it wasn't until 1939 uh, that uh, here uh, 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 Untermeyer bought an estate out in Palm Springs. He had breathing problems, asthma, and the, the air, the mountain air helped him. And Einstein came out to visit his old friend. And I think he knew that Untermeyer was dying and he wanted, I'm sure, to patch things up. Um, and Untermeyer knew that the end was near and um, he felt that the garden was a national treasure. And I, the reason I take this, I had to show this picture is not because of Reichstag, but because of the picture of Robert Moses. And it says, Lair and bleakly ask aid of Moses in Untermeyer dilemma. So Untermeyer wanted to give the entire estate, 150 acres to New York State to be a, a state park and garden met with Moses, Moses said, no, he didn't, it was too much slopes and he couldn't put in parking lots and football fields. Then he tried to offer it to Westchester County to be a county facility. Westchester is one of the wealthiest counties in, in America. They said no. And his last choice was to leave it to the city. And they said no, because it would all go off the tax rolls. So then he died the next year in 1940, again asked the state, they said no, asked the county, they said no, and asked the city. And it took the city six years to agree to accept um, 16 acres. So uh, Untermeyer died, as I said, uh, in 1940. This is a front page article in the New York Times. Uh, Herbert Lehman, who was a governor of New York, um, you know, his family founded Le Lehman Brothers. Uh, he was young, he was like 20 years younger than Untermeyer and said, I've known Untermeyer since I was a little boy. And uh, the Lehmans and the Untermeyers have been friends for a long time. And there are few people in America who were as brave and courageous 
as Samuel Untermeyer. Um, so after his death, um, the family, you know, you know, like a lot of great men, I don't think that Samuel Untermeyer necessarily was the greatest father in the world. Uh, he had three children surviving. They just wanted to get rid of everything. So the um, Untermeyers had, uh, Sam and Samuel and Minnie had gone to Berlin on one trip and bought a magnificent fountain, this magnificent fountain called um, the Dancing Maidens, and they installed it in front of their mansion. Remember when I showed you where the mansion had been on the side plan and there's a little circle? The circle was where this fountain was. So the children actually gave this fountain to the city of New York, and it is in Central Park. It's one of the most beloved fountains in Central Park. It's in the Conservatory Garden up at 104th Street and Fifth Avenue, and it's called the Untermeyer Fountain. Uh, there was a huge auction by Park Burnett of his belongings, including many garden furnishings, including this one here, uh, lot number 1032, marble torso of Aphrodite, third through second century BC. This was in that East Stoa. This shows it on the left where it was. There is a sculpture very similar to this in the National Gallery in Washington. I'm not sure that it was it, but it was sold off. So the garden was filled with magnificent antiquities and sculptures, almost all of them. So many of them sold off and the rest of them stolen or pill pillaged when it became privately owned, uh, publicly owned. Um, this is an article that appeared in the, in the, wall, in the um, New Yorker magazine a few months after his death. Uh, it is on our website. It's a fascinating article. Talks about the gardens and Untermeyer's lifestyle in this in this home. Um, so uh, during you know the period when it became publicly owned, uh, the low point, as I say, of of kind of this hippie period would have been uh, David Berkowitz, who was the son of Sam. He was a mass murderer. Uh, who terrorized the nation in New York in the 70s. He lived about a mile away and hung out at the garden a lot. Um, as I said, there was a satanic um, uh, cult that developed there with animal sacrifices. No one was murdered at Untermeyer, <laughs> thankfully, but it was, it was bad. And the high point of the hippie period was uh, when a, a very famous rock and roll photographer named Bob Gruen uh, his girlfriend came from Yonkers and she, they had nothing to do one day. This is like 1973. And she said, there's this ruined garden in Yonkers. You want to go look at it? And Gruen was this rock and roll photographer and he was a photographer for the Beatles. And so he said, let me call up John. So he called up John Lennon and said, you want to go see this ruined garden? And he said, sure. And so he took this picture of John Lennon uh, in, uh, 19, in the early 70s. So the garden was really a wreck in the 70s. This is what it looked like. So there was an important restoration effort in the 70s that basically kept it alive, but it quickly went downhill again in the 80s, 90s, and the aughts. And so when I started the conservancy again, it, was, it wasn't this bad, but it was definitely really bad and very, very uh, uh, overgrown. Um, this is a photograph taken in the early, 30, uh, early 60s. Uh, this is a, an ancient relief from an imperial sarcophagus. This is unbelievably valuable and had incredible provenance. It was stolen or chiseled away by thefts. It's, you know, disappeared from the garden. Uh, so when I started the Conservancy 10 years ago, I had been on the board of Wave Hill. Wave Hill is a beautiful public garden in the Bronx where I now live. I used to live in Yonkers. And so I was on the board there and it was created over a 35 year period by a man named Marco Polo Stufano, who was pretty much kind of the Dean of American horticulture. No one considered higher than him. He had retired from Wave Hill. And so I asked Marco uh, if he would join me uh, as an advisor uh, at the garden. And what was interesting is that his mentor at, uh, uh, in gardening at the New York Botanical Garden was a man named T.H. Everett. And T.H. Everett got his start at Untermeyer Gardens in the 20s. So we had T.H. Everett, who was like the Dean of American Horticulture, uh, who got his start at Untermeyer Gardens in the 20s. His prize student in the 60s was Marco. Marco becomes his successor as the Dean of American Horticulture. And Marco recommended Timothy Tillman, who is the man on the right, to be our head gardener. He is a protege of Marco's. 
And believe me, I think that he will be, he is passing the torch to Timothy to be one of the, you know, the Dean of American Horticulture in time, because what he has done at Entremar Gardens uh, is amazing. Um, so I'm gonna conclude my lecture in just a moment, but um, I just wanna say it's, it's been great uh, speaking to you. Uh, uh, the garden is almost entirely supported by uh, private donations. We, we operate out of a one room office and have you know, worked miracles. There's a book that's been published by us last year. And um, I have a great newsletter um, that uh, I send out with just, it's like a half a page long with a lot of pictures every couple of weeks. And if you send us an email, we'll sign you up for the newsletter. I think you'll really enjoy it. And if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe. So in conclusion, you can see that Untermar Gardens is not just about pretty flowers. It is a place that operates on the highest level in terms of aesthetics, garden history, architectural history, American history, even spiritual meaning. The fact that a Jew married to a Christian created an Islamic garden based on the Edenic idea of peace and brotherly love carries quite a wallop. This alone is incredibly interesting, but there's much more to it when you look at the lives of Samuel and Minnie Untermeyer. From economic reform to women's suffrage, American anti-Semitism and anti-Nazism, Samuel Untermeyer was consistently and progressively on the right side of history, and Minnie was doing her part to advance American culture. There is a congruence between the lives that the Untermeyers led and the message of this garden. Form and content are marvelously intertwined. How lucky we are that these gardens survive in Yonkers and in the fullness of time can possibly stand as a symbol of harmony for the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was a fantastic walk through those gardens. We do have a few questions and we'll take just a couple of them. I think the most popular question is how do we visit? What are your pandemic rules? What's the best season? So uh, um, my guess is that we, we may have to revert to timed entry. Uh, right now, you can just walk in the garden because there's hardly anybody there. So we're open daily from nine until four. Um, but once spring comes, we'll start getting more crowds. Uh, we, we don't have any visitor services department, so we rely on volunteers to help us with timed entry. So my guess is it will probably be Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays by timed entry, like 12 to 6 p.m. Uh, you know, when enough people are vaccinated and, and the government allows us to open, um, we'll be open seven days a week. I mean, we're open all the time. We're one of the few public gardens in America that is free. There is no charge. You know, Samuel Untermeyer was a populist in the best sense of the world at word. He opened his garden to the public during his lifetime for no charge and we would do the same thing. And when's the best season? It's great spring, summer, fall. It's great. That's the right answer. That's what we say at Hillwood yeah. too. Yeah. Um, what is the next restoration project or big project? So the, um, as you can see, the, the ornamental vegetable garden, we've laid out the, um, uh, the beds um, and we're gonna build a hoop house this year so that we can grow vegetables under, it's not really under glass, it'll be growing under plastic because we can't afford a greenhouse, but an ornamental vegetable garden, the best one in the world is in Villandry in France and it requires you constantly to be putting in plants and taking them out constantly changing things. You have to have a greenhouse to back you up. So um, we're gonna plant the vegetable garden this year with a cover crop, but next year we will be planting it as a true ornamental vegetable garden. And we hope to begin the restoration of that Persian pool, the ziggurat, the mosaic line pool. That will go on from 2022 to 2023. Mm -hmm. Then I think hopefully after that, the color gardens. That's a, that's a great schedule of, of interesting things that if we do come and visit, we would be able to see happening. We had a couple questions about um, connections today of the Untermeyer family to the gardens, or just in general, kind of, is there, what happened to the Untermeyers in modern, right, in modern right. day? So good question. Um, 
Um, I, I started the Conservancy and was the chairman of the board for the first five years. I'm an architect, but it kind of took over my life. So I wound up leaving my architecture firm. So I'm now the president. So that's my full-time job. Um, so a woman named Anne Carmel succeeded me as the chair and she's the great granddaughter of Samuel Untermeyer. So the family, uh, you know, there's there's been a, a lot of tragedy in the family. I won't get into it, um, but um, so this ruined garden for so many decades was part of sort of this tragic aspect of their family. But the fact that we brought back this garden, and you know, not many people even knew who Samuel Untermeyer was when he when he was alive. He was in the New York Times every day for like 30 or 40 years. I mean, this woman who, she said she's never seen anyone who was just out there talking about every, so he was this larger than life person that people have forgotten about. So we're not only brought back his garden, but we're bringing him back. And it's been a wonderful thing for the family. We have another question about how is the restoration funded? You might have addressed this a little bit at the end. I mean, it's almost entirely been by private donations. And um, the, the Rock and Stream Garden was the one grant we got um, from New York State, which helped fund that. But we run a very lean and mean operation and we've been able to get a whole lot done. Uh, thankfully, you know, a lot of different people find a piece of themselves in it. So if you're Jewish, there's like major Jewish history here. If you're Persian, there's very interesting. We're reaching out to the Indian, the you know people from India and Pakistan. They, so there's lots of different pe people who love gardens, people who love history, people who love progressive causes um, are interested in this garden. Mm -hmm. We had an interesting question about you. Did you specialize in the Persian walled gardens, the Islamic gardens, or was that just an outcome of the research you've done? An outcome. I mean, I didn't. I didn't even know this was a Persian garden. I don't think that Samuel Untermeyer knew this was a Persian garden. Mm -hmm. He called it a Grecian garden. He filled it with these Grecian classical sculptures, and there was the, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian columns. But Bosworth, who designed it, the guy who designed it, he knew what it was. He called it a per, an Indo-Persian garden. So when I started. I didn't know it was a Persian girl. I didn't know Samuel Untermeyer was Jewish. So I'm interested in history. I'm interested in historic preservation. I'm interested in different religions. I'm interested in gardens. I'm interested in architecture. So it combined a lot of my interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of specific plant questions that maybe we can just kind of rattle off. Are the evergreens along either side of the restored long staircase cryptomeria? Yes. Yes, there you go. And are you, um, are the dahlias going to be eliminated entirely? This is from somebody who is very active in the American Dahlia Society. You know, we don't have any dahlias. Um, we don't have any greenhouses. And if you have, I mean, you don't have to have a greenhouse, I suppose, but um, I have to ask Timothy. Uh, you know, we're bringing, I mean, we brought back the rhododendrons, right? I mm -hmm. mean, he also had this world collection of, of chrysanthemums and we really don't have those. Um, I think we should. I think that's the answer. We should. And then a question, maybe this will be our, our last one. Just what are the total acre of the gar acres, acreage of the gardens? And that might be kind of a, a historical right. snapshot. Right. Right. So it, it was 150. Then it went down to 16 in 1946, but it actually grew. It's now 43. So that's great. So there was there was land that the hospital, one of the hospitals owned. It was to be a, a real estate development. It went through a series of real estate developers who were going bankrupt. One after the other went bankrupt. And then thankfully there was a huge preservation effort that brought it back into dedicated parkland. Well, I thank you so much, Stephen, for taking us on that tour of these fascinating gardens. I would imagine you're going to have some visitors that end up there that came from tonight's lecture. Um, I want to thank everyone who is our virtual attendees for tonight for coming and joining us. I hope to see many of you um, next week uh, at the next Great Homes and Gardens lecture. And I just wish everyone a good night. Stay safe, stay, stay warm. Take care.
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Good night. Good night.